the full screen. My apologies. I don't know how to do it. Oh, dear. So, let's see what happens now. Um, where was I? Oh, the, 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 uh, the, the questions. Uh, we have a big audio podio. No audio. Oh, there it is. Darn it all. My, oh, my. So, I'm now in a mini little screen. My apologies. I seem to either have one choice or another, but not both. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on herbicides affecting bees. Do provinces do anything to ensure they aren't affecting bee population with their spraying? Especially timing for spraying. I find it here in Alberta. They wait until it's taken over an area when they go spray it. I have never used to, to worry about it two years in a row, so they spray plants in full flower, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Please keep in mind, herbicides in general, I'm looking here, pesticides is the global term that includes herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, nematocytes, mycocytes, uh, avericides, whatever sites, okay? That is collectively called pesticides. Herbicides essentially are chemicals that mimic or act like plant pheromones, like hormones. They, they, yeah, they initiate certain processes in plants and cause them to do something, okay? Uh, or not to do something. Um, and generally that chemical pathway that is that has been developed to uh, to make this particular substance, whatever has been made, to work effectively on plants, that chemical pathway is not something that bees respond to. Bees generally have it's a it's a foreign thing. It, it doesn't work on them. Okay. Uh, so generally speaking, and I'm using this as a generalization, in most cases, herbicides are pretty benign to honeybee colonies. So I would not worry about it in that sense. Now, you mentioned here, uh, Julia, about the fact that you have also uh, sometimes spraying going on on flowering plants that bees visit. And even there, I would not be too concerned. Now, I would be concerned about it from a beekeeper perspective that suddenly your beautiful oral source has disappeared. Okay. Now, that is that is a sad occasion. But in terms of poisoning, the risks are not that high. And I, the reason for that is this. When bees fly on a particular crop, and suddenly one day there is a guy that goes and sprays the stuff to kill it because it's considered to be a weed, and I'm not wanting to judge out here whether it was justified or not. I'm talking here strictly about the risk to your bees. When that spraying goes on, often within hours, this plant, this weed, is going through contortions, through all kinds of uh, uh, means of, of, uh, of fighting this chemical. And it starts to shut down its nectaries most often. It starts to curl its leaves up and down and sideways and everything else. The bees that do happen to fly on this floral source, um, uh, much of bee behavior in terms of the orientation and the way how they uh, view the world and experience the world around them is through the olfactory sense. They have an acute sense of smell. When they fly onto a crop that suddenly has been treated with a chemical they are most often repelled by this smell, by this herbicide. And they will cease to fly on that source very, very quickly. Okay. There may still be a possible, a few of these uh, bees that still will uh, uh, fly and bring some of the chemical back to the hive. The amount, the actual quantity of herbicide that is brought into the hive in comparison to all the other bees that fly and bring stuff in, is so minuscule, is so small, that I would just not be worried about it. Bee poisoning mostly takes place when you deal with a pesticide 
that does have an impact and a chemical pathway into the bee. And there we are talking about insecticides, such as the, the neonicotinoids. And we talk about, in the past, we had, of course, the carbamates and the organophosphates and the organochlorines. These were all terribly hard chemicals, okay? And in fact, these hard chemicals, the carbamates, the organochlorines, and the organophosphates, were replaced in the 70s or 80s, and then steadily replaced in the 90s with this new series of insecticides called neonicotinoids. Okay, and these are all by definition uh, nerve poisons. That is what they do, and they are posing a risk, but herbicides in generally don't. Now, one caveat in all of this is true, and that's why I must mention it, not that I have uh, detailed information available, but with the use of all these different chemicals, there is also the danger, and that is some, some researchers specialize in studying this, is called synergism. It is the interaction of different man-made products that are inside of the hive or inside of the environment. So, for example, as beekeepers, we use a very, well, quite an attractive product to control varroa mites. We use formic acid. In a previous session, I mentioned to you that formic acid is the simplest of all the organic acids. It's very volatile, and it is very reactive. It reacts very readily, chemically, with other products in the environment. It is conceivable, therefore, that if you have your bees, if you have treated them with formic acid, and the bees bring in another substance, whatever that may be, traces of herbicides, let's say, that it is conceivable that the traces of formic acid and the traces of herbicides may react with each other to create a poison that the bees suffer from. I'm, I'm using this as a fictitious description about formic acid and, and an herbicide. I'm just picturing you a scenario that is possible. Okay? But again, herbicides in general are not really posing a risk to bees. Ah, Somebody is asking about raccoons. Um, are raccoons willing to go through the grief of being stung and persisting going for the money for their honey? Raccoons are not interested. I would be very surprised that anybody would suffer from the raccoons. Now, uh, skunks is a different matter. Skinks are also, skunks are not interested in the honey. They just can sit in front of the hive at night and they just tuck, 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 tuck. They go at the front entrance. The bee comes out to have a look what's there and it is picked up uh, to be eaten. Okay. The amount of bees that are uh, preyed on is, is, is not that great. Uh, I guess you have more of an, an base of the odor of skunks around your hives that it is more bothersome than the number of bees that you lose, okay? So I wouldn't worry about it. Raccoons generally are not that interested. And honey is not something that they really want to get uh, involved with. If they're interested, it's most often that they like uh, the, the brood, the bee brood, uh, that is far more nutrition to see uh, better for them. Um, let me see, are wax moths a problem in BC? Yes, there are, well, yes, sometimes it is. For beekeepers who leave their empty hive equipment stored for a long time in an area that is not bee tight, you have a good risk, a good chance that wax moth, the lesser wax moth, will move in. And the result of that is, is that you will see quite a bit of damage to that stored equipment. If you have a little bit of stuff that is affected by it, a very effective way of it is, is you just put it back onto the colony and the bees will clean it out in a very short time on it. Now there is also the greater wax moth and that one has reportedly been found in British Columbia on occasion, but with climate change and warmer summers and things of that kind, it is expected that this greater wax moth will become more common. And this wax moth is definitely more damaging than the lesser wax moth, okay? Uh, so, uh, and if it becomes, right at this moment, it's not going, it is not a big problem compared to what it is in the, the southern states, for example. So, um, 
Somebody is asking me here, William, about uh, what size box would you recommend for a brood chamber? Dayton, the three quarter or the medium sized box or the deep box? Well, it's entirely personal preference. You can have a combination of these two things, but you have to remember that if you go into all of a Dayton that is this size, okay, that more or less three of those Dayton sizes or the three mediums are the same more or less as two deeps, okay? There are some beekeepers that have both deeps and mediums. I find that a pure, because you deal with two sets of equipment. It is far better to standardize everything so that you have all of them are mediums or all of them are deeps, whatever you prefer. Okay. This is a, the mediums are a bit more expensive because you have more manufactured material by volume. Okay? But the advantage is that if it is good equipment, particularly here with the uh, um, uh, dovetailed uh, affair, um, that is very sturdy. If you look after it, you have these things for many, many years and they work beautifully. And Dayton's frames are as readily available as full depth frames. So there is no difference there. Okay. But that is the preference, but, you know, uh, young guys, yes, they like to have everything deeps. And as you get older, you become wiser, supposedly. And then you start to favor these ones more because they are much easier to handle. That's all. All personal preference. Okay. Um, I will be receiving a nuke in the spring. Should I check for mites right away? No, no. Wait for a few weeks and then you look for mites. You have to assume that when you get your nuke in the mail or delivered or whatever, okay, that is probably in June. By that time, these bees go, you know, uh, full steam. They are healthy. Your supplier has made sure that they are not riddled with mites. That doesn't mean there are no mites in it. That may be an occasional mite. Don't worry about it, okay? So let them establish themselves first. Let them have a nice run at it and two or three weeks down the line, then you go and do a mite test, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's going to be, and by the way, the first year is always what they call the glory year. You know, your bees are doing so well that you suddenly come to the conclusion, my, I am the best beekeeper, oh, phenomenal. The challenge of beekeeping mostly starts in the following winter and beyond, okay? Keep that in mind. So your first year is always going to be successful, largely because you're getting bees from someone else who has gone through the trouble of keeping them clean and healthy and all this stuff. Okay, so um, somebody is asking me about what temperature and time of the year can you use the, the gadget that heats up the powdered oxalic acid. Okay, so that is basically a little metal cup with a long stick or a metal uh, stem and a an handle and an electric cord that goes to a battery. If you have uh, electric power next door, then that is fine, you can use that. But often they work on 12 volt batteries and so you can carry that in the apiary. And what it is is that in this little cup, you put in your crystals of oxalic acid, you turn the darn thing on and 30 seconds later, uh, about 30 seconds later, uh, all the, the crystals will just uh, well, evaporate or sublimate into a gaseous condition and um, you can close the hive off. And so the fumes are then inside of the space of the hive and they, the gases go through the filter, through the, uh, no, not through, I mean, in between the frames and it will treat all the bees. And the bees, if they have any mites, the mites will, will loosen their grip and they will fall down. You can do that at any time. There is no temperature sensitivity associated with it. It is mostly with the, uh, well, unless it is very hot, you shouldn't do these. It is an irritating substance to the bees. So if you do that in the height of summer and outside temperature is 30 degrees and you start to fumigate these bees, uh, that cause more damage than good. Uh, I would recommend that you are very careful there and you do it generally in the fall or spring season and when there is less brood available. Okay. These devices do work quite well. Uh, have you heard of the Varroa gate from Bayer? 
Yes, I don't want to go into that now because it is not readily available. And some of these gadgets that beekeeping organizations put together are often uh, nice concepts, but are not necessarily proven to be very effective. Or if they are effective, they sometimes require a lot of management activity around it. And beekeepers often don't want to do that. So um, try some of these things when you have become good at basic beekeeping and then you start to experiment and try things out. Uh, beekeepers love little gadgets, there's no question. And uh, you know, it is always seeking the, the better mousetrap type of situation. So uh, another question here, I put a half pollen patty in November in the hive. It has been sub-zero since then, except for the cold, odd day when they broke cluster in a cleansing flight. So I don't imagine they used the paddy. Now, the question in my head would be, uh, Mr. Bruce, is why would you want to put in a pollen paddy in November? Try to think about what you're trying to do. Uh, it, you probably want to look after the bees to give them a nice meal. But essentially, you give them an input of nutrients, protein, which causes them instinctively to start rearing brood. Well, when they start to rear brood, they probably don't have the temperature to control it very well, so the brood is probably going to die. Also, you may also stimulate any varroa mites that are inside of the hive. Please respect the fact that the bees are wintering. And in the winter time, they don't have access to pollen. They don't have access to food sources. They have to rely on stored materials. So I would refrain from stimulating the bees in the middle of winter. Let them be, or late fall, let them be wintering on their own. Let them be doing their thing, okay? You should make sure to have your colony in the right condition in the fall season to prepare them for winter but when the winter is finally on, don't do anything. Don't disturb them. At least that is my recommendation. Okay. Um, uh, so I hope that you, uh, I, I know that now everybody can see me in a full screen. And knowing me, I mean, I would necessarily find it necessary to see me in a full screen. But anyway, um, super syrup, two to one. That's always the same one. Two to one means two parts sugar to one part water. Sure. Okay. So uh, that is a thick syrup. So what you do normally, you put that here, you know, in the kitchen rather than somewhere out in the field. And I would suggest that you have a big pot. You do this, and uh, with an uh, a cordless uh, 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 electric screwdriver or uh, driver, you put in one of these paint uh, mixers. You know, these things that you can get at the hardware store to mix up or to stir paint and you just stand out there you just do that and the sugar will dissolve much more readily you have to warm it up uh, you know not cold water just warm water not hot because if it is very hot it may start to caramelize the sugar you don't want that so at room temperature of 30 or 40 degrees somewhere in there uh, that is great to dissolve all this sugar okay. and you get a ratio of two to two to one and then you let it cool down a little bit until you have it at about 20 degrees and you're going to feed it to the bees and the bees will love you forever. That's, uh, oops. So we are surrounded by orchards. Should we be worried about all the chemical sprays? Yes. Well, yes and no. Orchard growers, crop growers are very aware that they will not have fruit set if they are actively destroying the bees. Their label requirements are also such that they put restrictions on when they can spray. Generally speaking, bees are kept very successfully in orchards environments in the Okanagan at the time when there is flowering taking place. At flowering, the, the orchardists are not permitted to use any insecticides or products like this. They may, if it is a very wet spring season, they may be forced to apply a fungicide. That is quite possible. But generally, fungicides are also not expected to be of great impact on, on, on bees. Although that has uh, been challenged in recent research, but generally speaking, 
uh, when the flowering is taking place, most of the fruit uh, crop producers refrain from spraying. Okay. If uh, and when the, when the when these crops no longer bloom, when there is no flowering taking place, uh, the bees are no longer interested to visit their orchard, and and as a result, they don't really uh, pose an immediate uh, risk of exposure to to the bees. Okay. Now there are certain circumstances where you have drifting going on of some of these insecticides that are perhaps sprayed, and there is too much wind and the spray, the, the insecticidal spray essentially may drift and cause some bee exposure. But most of the time, this is not really an acute situation. And if you go to the Seville Camino, of course, that is uh, described as an organic uh, farming environment where sprays are not used at all or virtually none of it or very little anyway. Concerning the drone removal method for mite control, remove and place in freezer for four or five days, then return to the hive for the bees to clean up. My question, and Lorraine, you stopped asking the question. I don't know what you wanted to ask about this, but that this, uh, all that I can say is when you use the drone frame as an organic, biologically responsible way of getting rid of some drone or some varroa mites, you don't do this all the time, okay? So what you do is you do install that 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 frame with drone, and you put that in the center of the of the of of the brood chamber in the top of oh, this is another thing. Okay, it is the wrong. I, I don't know where the, my drone frame is, but it is here somewhere, maybe in the lower box. Okay, the green one. Okay. You put that right in the center of the cluster. You leave it in there for the prescribed time. And you come back about, uh, what, 12 days later, and you see how much of it is covered in brood, okay, and kept brood, how much is filled up. And it doesn't have to be 100%. You don't wait until it gets too late because then the, the, the drones will start to emerge. But if most of it is then nicely covered, you take that baby out, make sure that you don't have the queen on there, okay? And after, if the queen is there, you take her out and you very carefully put her back into the box. And then you shake the bees off and you can use a brush. And so on. now you have a beautiful drone cone, a frame of, of drone, uh, drone uh, brood. Now you shove these, these frames a bit back together again, or you use uh, an, an extra frame from outside, a normal frame, brood frame, and you put that in. This one you freeze. Okay. Four or five days. You take it out, let it thaw up to room temperature, and then instead of placing it right in the center. Don't do that. No, don't disturb the nest again. But you put that here at the very edge or the second frame in. So the second frame, you take that baby out and you put the drone comb there. That is, and if you do that at day 12, it means that much of that brood has just been capped by the bees. In other words, the the the, uh, the the drones have just entered their cocoon stage. Okay, so they're still very soft bodied. They're still not formed as an actual total uh, uh, drone yet, but they have all the mites in them as well. That is the time to take it out. Now, if it is 12 days or 14 days, that's fine. But don't wait until day 23. Not only are then the first one emerging. But by that time, these uh, drones are almost fully developed, and they are much harder to recy be recycled by the bees than if they're still soft bodies uh, uh, at day 12 to 14 or something. Okay, And you put it on the side so that the you don't have the risk that the queen will promptly go back in and start laying eggs in there again. Okay, Makes sense. So uh, that's the effect. Oh, and don't do this all the time. You do this maybe twice over the season. But one time in April, for example, or May, and you do that one time in July. Again, this is not sufficient for controlling the entire mite population. Mites are able to reproduce much faster, but it is a very complementary pressure reducing activity, okay? Without chemicals, without anything. So it is helpful, but it is complementary. It's not sufficient as your principle might control strategy. Okay. I hope that that was the question. <laughs>
We live in the interior. Are you in favor of using sugar fondant? And approx approximately, when do you suggest putting them into the hive? Uh, the, the, the drawback of fondant is this, that yes, it is, it is okay, but often, uh, particularly when you are in the southern interior, I don't know where in the interior you are, but um, what the, but the problem is, is that if you uh, it, it, it can dry out, and when it dries out, it becomes a cement block. In other words, it becomes almost non-accessible to the bees, uh, or harder for the bees. They have to work hard on working on the fondant. But it is okay. Uh, right now, in the last few years, there seems to be quite a few people that now suddenly like fondant. I, I don't know. It's sometimes a little bit on a flavor of the month type of thing. Sugar syrup has always proven to be a very effective and an uh, accommodating means of feeding the bees. But uh, I would suggest try it out. And if you have more than one colony, uh, give them two different treatments and see which one is doing better. Uh, you have to do perhaps a little bit of experimenting to see in your area what is the best way to, uh, to go about doing this. So, um, um, this might be a silly question. There are no silly questions. Uh, but when we do monitoring for mites and have to collect three, uh, say 300 bees, are these bees live or dead? No, no, no. You have to get live bees. That's the problem, Eva. Uh, collecting a bunch of dead bees, well, you won't find too many mites on. Okay. So and that is the problem. What you do is, again, I mentioned this last week. Uh, if you have your brood frame taken out of your box or out of your hive, make sure there is no queen on it. And then you hold it a little bit ways this way. So you have the surface, the lower surface leaning towards you. And then with your, with your jar, instead of going from the bottom up, which we tend to do, no. What you do is you very carefully, you put it against it gently, and the bees are all over it you gently pull it down very gently and the bees just roll in They're very pliable and you shake it a bit so that you keep them down and then you do it again you may want to do the other side and then see whether or not you hit the line of your pot uh, and if you have enough bees don't worry about when it's a little bit less or a little bit more it's okay okay and then you do your test, either icing sugar method, and then the bees will stay alive, or you do, and then you'd have to do that a couple of times, at least, with the icing sugar, shake it out again, and so on. Or you use the windshield wiper fluid method, and that tends to shake out more mites. Okay, that's that's the way to do it, and I would uh, would think it's uh, it's uh, it's an uh, it's an effective way of of going about it. Now, for those of you who are saying, well, gee, you know, but I don't even have 300 dead bees to measure my pot uh, to, to find out where that line is. Well, between you and I, I've figured out that if you want to have your beautiful mason jar with the line, what you do is you put in an, your favorite wine glass or you measure 175 milliliters of water or wine, why not? And uh, uh, you put that into... Uh, the, the 175 mils and you pour that in and that is where you draw the line after you've drawn the line you can drink your wine and in that way you have more or less your standard 300 uh, b volume okay so um, and again the key here is that this test is not that accurate but it is sufficiently accurate for you to get over time to get a pretty good idea of what's in that hive so, um, okay, and let me just see here. Is there a good way to find out location of hives in your neighborhood? Yeah, your backyard. Uh, it, the question is, is there a way to find out locations of hives in your neighborhood? Oh, uh, sorry. That question is uh, trying to find out other bee hives, bee colonies. Yeah, the best way to do that is uh, not go drive around and look over anyone's fences. I would suggest you join a local bee club and pretty soon you will find out where the principal players are. Uh, I, I would not uh, expend a great deal of energy and interest into where other beekeepers are in my neighborhood. The density of beekeepers in a neighborhood will always be low unless you are living in Slovenia or something where I think just about every 
family member in the land has a beehive, but out here that density is not that high. Okay, but it is a point, uh, an important one in that beehives are uh, exposed to uh, to the import of diseases from bees that visit, uh, come and visit, and um, that is the way how pearl mites in particular. Uh, spread very rapidly uh, throughout an area because the drones, these darn drones, they love to visit other hives and check out whether there are any virgin females coming online, uh, virgin queens, and so that is why they are continuously on the prowl, so to say, and so they often carry a souvenir in the form of a of, a, of some mites. So, um, so I would uh, and, and 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 basically join a local club. A local club is often really good to get your your first feel as to what's going on in, in the neighborhood or in the area. In Victoria, there, is, there are significant issues with yellow jackets, and I'm wondering what all I can do to help my bees withstand this pest. Well, there are some interesting things. Beekeepers, like so much of us, many of us, we don't do anything proactively. We wait until it becomes a problem, and then, oh God, now we have to do something. My recommendation with wasps is twofold or threefold is this. Start controlling your wasps in May, not in July and August at the height of barbecue season and as soon as you are in the backyard, the wasps are there. No, if you put in a trap in and around May, what happens then is you're not trying to kill the whole wasp population. No, but you reduce or temper the population expansion of the wasp population. And these are mostly yellow jackets. How do you do that? Well, of course, you can go to a nice garden supply shop and you get yourself your beautiful, fancy, wonderful uh, uh, wasp traps. But a very simple one you can use is you have a two liter pop bottle and you cut off about uh, one, the top one quarter of it. Okay. And then that, 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 top you invert and you put that there you tape it and so you have essentially an, an, a tubular you know container with uh, the, the top facing down and then all that you do is you put in maybe two inches of lovely super syrup you don't even have to put food coloring in although you could do that to make it extra attractive and in no time the wasps will be there okay and of course they're not smart enough they go in and they will not be able to get out and they drown and if you do that on a steady basis, you will not eliminate the local wasp population because they are important for the ecosystem, but at least you reduce the pressure. Second thing, make sure that you don't have food sources available to them. Open garbage cans, particularly close to schools. You know, lots of kids eat half their sandwich and then the rest of it's tossed. Well, you basically set the dining table for the wasps. And juice cans uh, and all these things, even if there is still a little bit of liquid in there, that is what attracts the wasps and support the wasp population. Thirdly, when you are getting into July, don't wait until August when they become a problem, but in July, somewhere in the middle of July, you put in the entrance reducer. Bees are far better in protecting their nest when they have a strong population and they have a small entrance to defend instead of a full one. Last but not least, you have also, and I was at Ape Among the Earth, uh, the, the big conference in Montreal last September, and I that was really fascinating. What they had done is that was a New Zealand producer and uh, or, or manufacturer. They had a standard entrance reducer, and then they had a, 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 a little device that was basically a very flat piece of plastic uh, uh, only only a few, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch high, and uh, there was just an entrance and a tunnel, basically a tunnel, a flat tunnel. And then at the end, it was about four or five inches long, and then at the end they had basically an, 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 a round opening or a square opening, whatever it was, to the top, so the ceiling was removed. So all that the bees had to do is they had to walk through this tunnel and then they came to the end of the tunnel and they could go up to their nest. Now, what is the significance of that? 
Wasps don't like to walk through a tunnel. They are kind of scared. And that makes me think. There are some people that have tried to put um, uh, their uh, an, an display hive inside of their house or something. You know, one of those things with plexiglass on both sides and you can beautifully, for, for, for display purposes, you can look at the bees and so on and so on. So often bees are then uh, having access to the outside world through a tunnel. So I am thinking there may be some beekeepers who will, instead of this de plastic device that can be purchased from New Zealand, that instead that they can install an, 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 an queen egg or an, uh, an, an entrance reducer by drilling a few holes in it and some plastic tubes that are maybe three or four inches in length. And I just wonder whether that will prevent these wasps to come in because wasps are kind of, you know, they, they, they get nervous, but they know they don't have an escape route. Okay? It's like your standard break-in artist, your, your, you know, your villain. Uh, I've been told by police one time, said, yeah, that's the way they do it. They first check out before they commit any crime. What they do is they check out the neighborhood to see how easy and, uh, it is to escape. That is their priority. If they cannot escape readily, they won't commit the crime because too much risk is involved. The same with the wasps. Okay, something to uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and if you get any uh, big earnings on it, um, you know I'm uh, I'm happy for some residual benefits that come flowing with this fantastic idea. Maybe it is a very effective way of controlling wasps. Who knows? Um, let me see. AZ cabinet. No, Colleen, sorry, I didn't look at the uh, chance to look at the AZ cabinet hive designer format. My apologies, I teach another course at UBC in the coming week, and I'm up to my eyebrows and stuff, so I'm sorry I have so much short in time. My question is, are you concerned about the bees contracting viruses from the mites as they carry them, and many of the viruses are viable even after freezing? So are you reducing those viruses to the hive? See, I don't know how the question is framed, Lorraine. My apologies. However, yes, we are worried about these viruses. Generally speaking, when uh, there are, uh, when you have had bees that died with the mites inside of a hive body, and after some vacancy, uh, there is very little risk that the viruses and the dead bees that are still inside of the hive. Uh, when you uh, put fresh bees in it, let's say at the year, the next year, then the next spring, uh, there is minimal chance that these viruses will be activated. I think that most of these viruses will be dead uh, as well, uh, together with the old bees and the old mites and everything else. So I wouldn't worry about the transmissibility uh, in case a hive or a colony has died. Uh, you can certainly reintroduce bees in that equipment. Uh, there is here also a question about uh, swarms and swarm boxes and attractants. Um, uh, um, well, I think I talked about swarms already. Um, the best thing, of course, is that you are uh, um, um, again, swarming season is in April and May. Okay. Now, there is a fine balance, and that is something that comes with experience, and I, I, it is not kind of an escape remark, but the point is, is that, you know, what is crowdiness and what is not crowdiness? I have been telling you early on, in order to stimulate brood rearing and successful brood rearing, you don't give the beehives, uh, the colony, a huge pile of boxes that are all empty, because they are shivering all the time. They cannot keep the darn church warm. So you have to crowd them a little bit. But on the other hand, crowding will also cause lack of air circulation and higher temperatures. And at one point, crowdiness to the point where the bees say, hey, we are, we're going to make another nest somewhere else. So we are going to create some queens. And these queens are swarm cells. And they will then start to issue swarms if you're not watching them carefully. It's a good question about the swarms. What happens is that when they start to produce swarm cells, okay, these are virgin queens, they mostly built, the bees mostly built them at the bottom of the brute frame. So
So be careful that in April and May, you look closely at the whether there are any queen cells out here at the bottom. If th this sets it apart from a supersedure queen, that is, a supersedure queen is that when the bees want to replace mama queen because she is too old or mama queen is dead and they don't have a queen, then they build a nest, a, a cell right here in the center of the, of the, of the, of the comb. Okay? Or not just one, but sometimes more than one. When you deal with supersedure queens, don't worry about all oh, them to swarm. No, 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 no. They won't swarm. What happens is the first queen that will emerge from an, as the new queen for this nest, she will go to the other cells and before the others emerge and kill them and sting, sting through the through the cell, and it will kill the the resident that is in there, the, the other queens that may emerge. Swarm cells, on the other hand, are different. Swarm cells is where the colony collectively have said, we are doing so well, we are going to split the hives in two and more and uh, try to establish new nests farther away in the neighborhood. Okay, and So therefore, you have often the queen cells at the bottom. Initially, what you could do is you take all the cells out. You say, I don't want that. I don't want to have swarms. An alternative is the Demery control method. And I had sent this to you, and that was this baby of a hand sheet, you know, with these colors. Please follow this because it works very well. It's a very foolproof way of keeping the same number of colonies, but uh, splitting it, reducing the risk that you end up in the neighborhood with uh, bees in the top of the tree. Okay. For those that would like to have another hive, well, then you basically can split them uh, into two. You you basically create an artificial swarm, as what we call it. Okay. And in that case, you can move, etc. I talked about this uh, two weeks ago, I think. Okay. Swarm control. Yes. Um, it's a fantastic and a magical thing that happens when they do uh, emerge and fly off. I mean, a very uh, intimidating. Um, in intimidating process to look at or for, for people who are unfamiliar with beehives. It's phenomenal to see. Um, uh, so let me just see here what else is there. You're in full screen now. Well, that's fine. That is great. I have a full screen. Everybody has a good full screen. Uh, good question. But the question is, how about using crumpled up the newspaper in the top of the hive in the winter to control moisture here on the West Coast? Excellent question, uh, Alison, and that is partly to do with the fact that here on the West Coast, uh, we live here in, in a temperate rain forest environment. Moisture is the killer. A couple of things that you should do as a beekeeper, apart from just keeping your hive dry. That's why I'm a promoter of bee houses, as I showed you before. But if you don't have that facility and you have to keep it in the field or in the garden, what you should do is have, first of all, put your entire hive on a set of cinder blocks or something, about a foot off the ground. Get rid of all that soil moisture that continuously comes up. Okay. Also, make sure that your hive is a little bit tilted forward. So that if there is any water accumulation inside of the hive that it runs off, okay, you don't want to have pulley in there. That's one thing. The second thing is, is that if you have your winter uh, colony prepared for winter and you put your, your inner cover out here, you can put something onto the hole to get that closed off as well. It doesn't have to be nailed down because it is, of course, you can just simply put a little flat piece on there uh, so that the hole is kind of covered, uh, but you can easily remove it in case you have to feed them, okay, with your little bucket. But for the winter time, what you can do then is you can put this down here, and then you can put an empty box without frames on top of that, and then on top of that, you put your, I don't have an empty box right now, so, but you know what I mean? And so you have now a whole space out there. You can fill that up with crumpled newspaper. Quite, quite, quite good. Not just newspaper, you can use wood chips or you can use whatever insulating material. 
newspaper is perfectly fine. They will absorb some water and it is easy to do. You can also remove it from the winter if it is moist, that you can take it out and you put in new newspaper. It's an excellent insulator, okay? And it keeps the air dead. And this is the whole idea that it is totally nice and cozy and warm. Very good way to do it. Um, and the bees will love it. Moisture is the killer. That's really an, an uh, uh, effective way of uh, doing it. Somebody has here some other stuff sent to me. Um, um, this year we purchased an infrared camera that attaches to a phone. All right. We took pictures of the hives at night and they showed the bee clusters in each hive. Wonderful. It proved to be very interesting as it gave us a better understanding of what was happening. We found doing the pictures in the dark made it a better picture as opposed to having a reflection of the of the black blankets during my the day. Fair enough. It's interesting that in, uh, I did research uh, or was part of a research project in the early 1980s in at Beaver Lodge up in the Peace River. And there we didn't have, of course, at that time, the world didn't have these sophisticated things like, uh, you know, here, uh, infrared uh, things that you can put on your smartphone. No, uh, but that was just the beginning of the, uh, you know, the electronic age. So we had an, a set of four colonies uh, in an, on, a, on a pallet, two that way, two this way, close together. And then in each of those boxes, we had thermistors, very small little things with little wires going all over the place and big cables coming out that went into the big bee house or yeah, into the, into the house that we had to, into the facility. And then every morning I, I would run a huge long uh, program that would take uh, measurements of the temperature of each of the thermistors that were located in known locations. So we had this long printout and then, oh gosh, everything by ma ma manually. Can you imagine? We had kind of three-dimensional drawings, okay? And then we would measure out where these these thermistors were and indicate the temperature. And on that basis, we could make drawings by hand of essentially the cluster. Where was the cluster of the bees inside of such a hive over the course of the winter season. And it was so remarkable that we had in the Peace River, you at the time we had often temperatures of minus 30 or sometimes even minus 35. And yet inside of these colonies, the temperature was kept at 30 to 33 degrees Celsius. It was at the end of the winter season when they started to run a little bit lower on fuel, on food reserves, that you saw sometimes a bit of a dip that went into 29 and 27. And I can't remember the threshold, but there was somewhere a bit lower down where the cluster temperature hit a certain point and guaranteed as soon as they would hit that, they were lost. And you could see then the decline and the eventual death of that colony. So it was a really interesting dynamic that was, uh, that was taking place uh, in the middle of winter. So it's, uh, there are a lot of wonderful things that are being done. So um, can you get nukes in the three quarter or Dayton size? Excellent question. No, you cannot. And it's a good point because it's something that I thought of mentioning and I know it's getting late here, but um, so here we have a full depth frame versus the, the other one, which is the medium size. So typically when you purchase a nuke or order a nuke, you get a little box, often a cardboard box, specially designed for this with four frames in it, all full depth nukers, uh, full depth frames. Sometimes of questionable quality, but not, not, not the standard. So what I would suggest is this, and if you have decided to have everything in medium sized, you should have one box in full depth to accommodate this to accommodate your nuke purchase. And so what you do, you can do various things. What you can do is you have, you put your, your, your full depth super there and you transfer out of the cardboard box, your four frames of uh, your, your, uh, of your nuke into the bottom box. Now there will be an oh, empty space on these sides. What you could do is fill that up 
with a few of those medium-sized frames, see? And you can just put them in there. They will not do too much activity because what happens is, is that the bees will have something to hold on to to keep it a bit warm, particularly the frame with the with the uh, uh, with the brood. But very quickly, the queen and everybody else are going to be tempted because of the temperature machine to go into the medium box that is above it. And it is a question of getting her to start laying eggs in your next, in your medium frame box. Okay? They will start to, they allow this, the, the, the brood of the nook mm -hmm. emerge, but very quickly after that, they will kind of abandon it. So, and then after a while, you can just take that box away and you put in more mediums and you are basically, you have converted everything into medium sized boxes. Okay. There's a good question. You, you, for, for, for have to run everything on medium sized stuff, you do have to have uh, one box as your transition box, if I can call it that. Okay. So, good question. And don't forget that, of course, because it is mostly in June where you can get such a nuke. The temperatures are generally warm enough that you shouldn't have to worry too much about uh, gaping holes and everything else. Yes, there's an amount of extra space out there, but don't worry about it. I would recommend that you just, regardless what the equipment is, put in an entrance reducer anyhow, because the nuke has to have some need some bit of time to get used to the new environment, and it doesn't uh, it needs to focus on setting up house rather than having to defend it against intruders. So uh, be a bit cautious in your approach on this. So if you go with the Dayton boxes only, would you have three of them for the base in the winter? Yes, indeed. Yes. So in other words, if you go Dayton, and by the way, I have no commercial interest in it whatsoever. You can do whatever you like. I'm just suggesting for your back, it is nice to have medium sized equipment. But this doesn't mean that you have to do this. If you decide to do it all medium, then I would recommend that you winter your colony in three mediums. Okay, that is a little bit more than. Uh, let me think now. Yeah, a little bit more than two de deeps, but close to the equivalent. I don't think that you should do it only in two mediums, although you could because two mediums is a bit more than one box deep. And one, there are beekeepers who run their bees uh, in the winter time only with one super or one, one chamber, okay? So one, two mediums would be certainly okay, but uh, mostly uh, the bees are a little bit more sensitive because they, they have a smaller house, they go through their food quicker. And the result of this is that if there is suddenly a very cold, you know, Arctic outflow in the late uh, winter that may just kill them off. So, and that is exactly what happened in early 2019, a year ago. So, um, yeah. But you will, oh, okay, never mind. So what is the good time of the year to start the beekeeping for the new beekeeper? Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, uh, Sukhvir. Uh, I would recommend that you don't get into package bees. What you do is you order from a reputable supplier here in British Columbia, a lovely nuke, nucleus colony, and you get that delivered with the target date of June the 1st. And you will see that your bees are going to be flying very well and doing very well for the first season. The challenges will come in the next year, okay? So you can be a proud beekeeper for the remainder of the season, and the bees will be nice and strong and, uh, and ready to go for the winter season next fall, okay? Nucleus colonies instead of packages. Uh, are you... Let me see here what else is there. Uh, would you suggest a sugar board in early spring or in the fall? Should, no, uh, it's early spring. A sugar board is better. In the fall season, a sugar board, it basically you have sugar uh, sitting on the, on the inner cover like that to feed the bees, is not sufficient in the fall season, and it is clumsy because they have to go through all the energy of storing it and everything else. No, sugar uh, is often given to them in the spring season simply as a short, quick, supplemental feed, okay? Liquid is by far the most versatile format. Minimal amount of work for the bees 
and they can readily absorb it and consume it instantly. Okay, so uh, this may be a little bit more work for you to prepare the syrup, but that's it. You mentioned 80 pounds of sugar syrup to feed them in the fall. Is that for each hive? Yes, it is for each hive. Yeah, that's right. You'll be surprised how much they take. But then you can also expect a lot of honey to come from it. Okay. Uh, you can all go onto our government website. And if you look under statistics, you can see there what the annual production, estimated annual production levels are in British Columbia. And uh, uh, what was it this last 2019 season? Um, um, the average was 32 kilos, so that was about uh, 70 pounds of uh, honey per colony on average. Of course, there are quite a bit of variations in it according to the regions and also among beekeepers, but that is not, an, not a particularly bad year. It's not a stellar year either, but 70 pounds per hive. And um, so that is, that, that, that's a good production level, reasonably good production level. So how many drone frame boards would you suggest per colony? No, 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 just one. You don't, uh, keep in mind, and again, try to think through with that. The question is, is about how many of these drone frames should you use in a colony? Only one, once, and then maybe a couple of months later, another time. Please remember that what these bees do is the eggs are laid, and then these bees are working very, very, very hard for weeks on end to feed all these hungry larvae with nutritious food for, 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 for days and days until day 10, 11, when they're capped. So all these food resources have gone into that frame. This comes at a sacrifice because other brood frames that also need brood development, worker brood, uh, will not be ignored, but there is only so much that the beehive can support. So one frame, go through that process, and then let's say in May, and you do it again one more time in July, or yeah, in July or so, and that's it. Don't do it too often. That's just too demanding on the bees. Uh -huh. Good source of information. Are the YouTube videos from the University of Michigan beekeeping on management of Faroa mites a good source of information? I do not know. I haven't seen them, so I cannot judge them at all. Uh, if it is from a university, mostly they want to make sure that it is of reputable quality and, and reasonable thing. Uh, so I, I don't know. Have a look at the University of uh, Michigan's uh, website and see what that is. I do know that the University of Guelph has come out with some very interesting uh, uh, freely available uh, extension material that can also be viewed on a YouTube basis uh, about management in general. So highly recommend it there. So um, can you manually remove honey or must you use a centrifuge? Well, manually removing honey, I don't know how you would do it other than what they do in Africa, in places like this, is they don't have a, an, an, an extractor. So what they have is, again, uh, the bar and the comb that hangs like this naturally. And what I told you before, the top of it is all honey. And then the, uh, there's a ribbon of pollen. And then underneath it is the bee brood. So the beekeeper there, the beekeepers, what they do is they want to have the honey. So they, with a knife, they cut out the whole shebang. And the top part is then harvested. And sometimes there's a bit of a feeble attempt to stick, stick that comb with all the brood kind of against that top bar. Of course, it doesn't hold it and it will fall down. But they try to preserve it a little bit so that the brood can still emerge. You're really talking more about raiding the colony. You know, there is often quite a bit of damage and loss involved. And that is the, the quality and the attractiveness of standard equipment that you do much less damage and you can reuse uh, the frames accordingly. And with, with, an, with an, uh, a clean excluder, you can separate your brood from your honey production. And that is what makes it attractive. But manually removing is you cut that out with a knife and then you need a press to... Uh, 
to, to separate the honey from the wax. Now, you have some people that have a specialty uh, thing. What they do is they get combed honey. They put in a pot, you know, that makes it very attractive. And there is a certain uh, procedure involved with that where you put special frames into your honey super that will produce combed honey. And you can look that up. Uh, one of the names is called Ross Rounds. That is R-O-S-S -S, Rounds. Google it. I don't want to go into all the details, but that is one way of getting combed honey. You recognize that it is lower uh, production levels than extracting honey with a centrifuge, okay? But it is one of the things you can do. Uh, wonderful gifts for Christmas, I can tell you that, that's for sure. Will a wasp trap catch my bees as well? Yeah, there may be an occasional bee coming in, depending on how rich of a sugar source you make it. Uh, if it is very rich, or if it is typically actual juice like like, uh, like uh, orange juice or something, the bees generally are not interested in that. The wasps are. Okay? So if you make it too rich of a sugar syrup in your wasp trap, yeah, the bees may come in as well, and then they will die. So um, let me just see what else is there. Uh, Anyway, I think that we have come to the end because it is now just about 12 o'clock. And um, there is one question here. Do you have a list of reputable BC suppliers of nucleus colonies for purchase that you could email out? No, but I would recommend what you do is you go onto the uh, BCHPA website, Google BCHPA or BC Honey Producers Association website. And there is a link to the BC Bee Breeders Association, which is an affiliate of the BCHPA. They have there a list of members and reputable queen breeders here in British Columbia. If you want to get into purchasing and ordering a nucleus colony or two, do so now because there is nothing better for these producers to provide you with a high quality product that they had plenty of time to produce. And here's the BCHPA newsletter. Again, I'm only a member. I'm not part of the organization itself, but we work very closely together, of course. And the BCHPA brings this out, this quarterly newsletter on, an, on, yeah, on a quarterly basis. Uh, really worthwhile, and there is always somewhere in there a page with a listing of their members of the BCHPA. So uh, that is a good source uh, for having it. It's right here. I can see it now. Um, this is what you see there. Um, BCB Breeders Association, and then there is a listing of all these characters in there. So it's easy for you to find it and go from there. Uh, I don't can I cannot place any particular preference one over the other. Uh, I just don't, don't know. And secondly, if I promote one, then the others get upset that they haven't been promoted. So the point is, is that I think that all of them are uh, honest and genuine, uh, dedicated beekeepers uh, that will provide the best possible product. Okay, we've come to the end of our uh, webinar series. I hope that, uh, well, that you learned something, and uh, I hope to, uh, to, uh, that you can o go over some of the materials that I have discussed and revisit maybe these recorded sessions, uh, that you can also revisit the uh, PowerPoint presentations and see what, uh, what, I, what I have presented and how that fits with the presentation itself. I will be sending all of you a, uh, a an email about uh, two weeks before the end of the contract so that you have still a last uh, kick at the cat in terms of uh, looking at um, uh, the material in question to see whether or not um, you have uh, anything uh, that you still want to see. In the meantime, uh, you can, of course, always email me uh, and if you have pertinent questions, and I will try to answer them when I have some time. This coming week, I will not have time because I will not be in the office, but 
uh, after that, I hope to be able to answer some more of the questions. So I wish you all uh, a great success uh, and, and uh, in your beekeeping efforts and that you uh, and try to commune with the bees, have fun with them. And if you're a good beekeeper, uh, they will be thankful. Okay. Best wishes to your beekeeping career. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the course. Thank you.